Lessons Learned, a show where we talk about the good, the bad, and the lessons in between. I'm your host, Captain Alyssa Hinckley, and this is Lessons Learned. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Episode 5. Here with me in the studio to talk about all the lessons she's learned is Lieutenant Colonel Leanne Brenneman. Welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. So normally, um, for those of our listeners who are used to this show, we normally kick this off with telling our listeners um, about you and giving a reading of your bio, but I definitely think it's better coming from you. So we're just going to jump right into it and get started. So ma'am, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about yourself and your military and civilian career. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. So I guess the first thing to really let everybody know is that I am a true M-Day soldier with a very unique start to my career. I actually, on the civilian side, had already completed both my bachelor's and my master's degree and had a career established as an educator in Riverton. And I decided to join the Guard. It was something that I'd always wanted to do. However, I went around things a little bit backwards and started my family and my civilian career. So I enlisted in the late 90s as an 09 Sierra so that I could go to basic training one summer and the very next summer shipped off to OCS. After returning from OCS, I took on the opportunity to be a lieutenant at the 133rd where I stuck around for a while as both a platoon leader and the XO and eventually the rear debt commander and then the commander. After leaving the 133rd, I spent some time at 94th Troop Command and was able to kind of experience a variety of staff jobs there throughout a number of years. Before I left and joined the joint staff as the EO, EEO, AMDA officer. When that position went away, I joined the J1 and eventually moved over to the J3 before I took my current position of the 213th Battalion Commander. So. Excellent. Um, so being an M-Day, we've actually never had anybody on the show that has been a true true M-Day soldier. Um, can you talk a little bit about balancing those two careers you know, between your military and your civilian career and what challenges you faced as being um, 100% the entire time a true M-Dayer? I can. So um, really, I think a couple of things. First, I can address the fact that one year... I guess I should say one year, um, that when I started my career as a principal or left the teaching field, so to speak, of and moved into administration was exactly the same year that I took on the 133rd rear debt. So the challenge of being a commander as well as being an administrator at the same time was one of those that kind of a baptism by fire where I had to figure out how to balance life and balance time and really develop that time management piece of both careers. Um, The other thing that really has been important by balancing both is balancing the educational piece. So on one hand, maintaining an opportunity to attend all of my military schooling but also continue to pursue my um, doctorate degree meant that I had to really balance education and time. And so I've really learned throughout balancing both that I need to make sure I have time for me, that I have time for my family, and that I have time for the Army, as well as time for my civilian career. And so I think some of the challenges really has have come from that time management piece, but more importantly, also the ability to be flexible. That doesn't always happen in the military world, but in the civilian world, it's kind of a demanding point of life that you have to be a lot more flexible. Life changes, COVID's a great example of the demands of my civilian career changing quite a bit, and how do I manage that? So I think between the two, as a true M-Day soldier, the one thing that I would take away is flexibility, but because of that, it's time management. That's a very interesting perspective you bring about um, the time management piece. I know that's difficult for a lot of us to deal with time management, especially being not, you know, the full time life or not being fully ingrained all the time, having your computer, having a phone, having everything and readily available. Um, So speaking on the, the time management piece, how do you also establish you know, you you kind of have to devote some of your free time into that military experience. But how do you maintain a work life balance between taking on too much or devoting too much time into your work experience, and then um, and and then balancing that with you know personal life? No, actually, that's a really good question. When um, I thought about that a while ago, a friend and I had been talking about maintaining that, especially as a principal, um, definitely with technology now where people expect you to be available 24-7 on cell phones and emails and all of that. And I can tell you that I failed many times. 
Um, there's times that I would realize as I went to bed that I'd forgotten to answer an email, that I'd forgotten to call somebody back, that I'd done things. So for me, it really became that key thing of managing my day by prioritizing what had to be done and learning how to say no to certain things that really had to be no. So I had to balance in when do I take the time to exercise because that actually was the first thing that I let go of for a while when life became busy and when you're not healthy, you can't maintain anything else. So really figuring out how do I prioritize my health, my family, and then looking within each job and looking for things that overlap or how can I balance them? So I really learned a lot about time management in prioritizing quickly answering emails that I can answer, um, getting rid of things that I don't need to do, and then also really trying to look for links and commonalities. So for example, if I'm off at a military school and it's an eight to five school, what can I accomplish at night that would still be tied to my civilian world? Or how do I reach back to my family? And really, again, it goes back to, and I live by a calendar, but it goes back to that time management, schedule things, calendar things, and things that aren't important, it's okay to say no. That's a tough lesson to learn. Yeah, definitely. I have that hard time of of shutting my phone off or, you know, when you're sitting there watching TV at night and not scrolling through to make sure that your emails are checked, you know, I have a hard time um, doing that and separating myself. Um, what have you seen throughout, you know, I think prior to us jumping on this show, we were talking about uh, the parallels between the military and your civilian career and education. So can you talk to us a little bit more about um, those parallels and and what you see as far as, you know, that bridge between you can accomplish things, you know, both on the military and the civilian side, or, or what parallels do you see in both of your careers? Sure. Um, probably one of the biggest parallels that I really see is in quality leadership. Uh, when I think back to, and we didn't really talk about it before, but we've talked about it before, about the idea of mentorship, I really think back to the quality leadership that I see in the civilian world, a lot of the skills and talents that some of my strongest mentors in the civilian world, what they possess, have been things that I could take into the military. There are also things that I've learned in the military schools that I can take over into my civilian leadership. Concepts of things like backwards design in education really parallels with the course of action work that we do in the Army, and being able to cross those two when there's an opportunity has been vital for me to really be able to not have to learn two separate careers, mm -hmm. but to really learn one career with two different branches is kind of the way that I've really thought about it. As an administrator, it's foundational. My job right now as a battalion commander is so connected or can be connected to the way I manage a schoolhouse. Right. I have instructors, I have students, we have to pass accreditation, we have to pass trainings. So there's been things like that. When I was a sharp, when I was a victim advocate and sharp trained, it was very similar. There's a lot of the crossover into, you know, how you maintain those professional relationships with my employees. But I think probably the biggest correlation that I've taken away is really the idea that at any given time, I need to look for opportunities to learn. In education, I'm always learning. I'm learning from people that work for me. I'm learning for people that I work for. And in the Army, I'm always looking for the opportunity to learn from those that lead me or from those that I lead. And if you're open to learning in either situation, both careers manage themselves. Right. Yeah. I think sometimes we, um, it's either one way or the other. We're, we're either like, full on lifelong learners or we're jumping into this is just a lesson that I'm, you know, learning or this is an opportunity to learn or we forget that we're supposed to be learning things or um, sometimes, you know, I have the I've always thought like I got into a position and I'm like, well, I'm supposed to know everything. But you forget that this is a you know, you kind of get on that one side all the way over there. That's like, I'm not supposed to learn. I'm supposed to be the expert. I'm supposed to be the one that knows. So can you tell us about a time that maybe you were in an experience where um, where you kind of forgot that you were supposed to be learning along with your soldiers and that you were a little bit intimidated or scared? Or do you have any of those situations where where you walked in and you 
were supposed to be the expert and you kind of forgot to, to learn or take that opportunity? Um, I guess there's a, always quite a few where I feel overwhelmed when I step in and at first I'm thinking, wow, if I'm supposed to be the expert, how do I do this? And one of them really is my current position as a battalion commander. You know, first showing up uh, at the RTI was a very interesting moment where right away there was that expectation of, okay, you know how to manage this schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. How do we, at the time, we were really struggling to build courses. How do you fix all of this? And right away there was more of that panic mode of, oh my gosh, I really don't know how to fix all of this. Like, I don't even know at the time field artillery. I didn't know much about field artillery being raised in the engineering world and spending time in the joint staff. I knew about field artillery, but I didn't know definitely what it came to teaching. I also know a lot about teaching, but I didn't understand the military framework of teaching. So right then and there, that panic mode of, wow, I'm supposed to know all this and I don't, definitely struggled as a leader for a little bit until I had that opportunity to work with some of the soldiers that I'd actually worked with clear back at the 133rd and they came up to me and they were like, you know, you don't have to know what we do yet. Mm -hmm. You just have to be willing to learn. And it was that step back of, okay, you're right. So then I started asking questions. Tell me about what we do, how we do this. And once I built that relationship where in my own trusted myself to build that relationship with others, to ask those questions again, much more successful. Then it's not a matter of expertise in the moment. It's a matter of growing your expertise together. And that team leadership that we have is definitely successful. Right. Yeah. I I think oftentimes we see that fear of asking those questions, but quite honestly, um, you know, I think people respect you a little bit more, especially your NCOs, if you are willing to be to ask those questions and to lean on them, um, which this kind of circles me back to um, the idea of mentorship and how we always think or not we always think, but a lot of times we have the tendency to think that mentorship is, you know, upward and and you think your mentors are always outranking you or they're upward. But can can you maybe talk about that concept of mentorship and leaning on, you know, for learning those lessons or for learning the the things you need to know from all of the people around you or leaning on your NCOs, leaning on um, your commanders or anything like that? I can. Um, probably my first opportunity to be exposed to mentorship was clear back at the 133rd. And now Command Sergeant Major Edie at the time was Staff Sergeant Edie. Mm-hmm. And when I entered the Guard, he was actually my platoon leader. So I was an E4 in his platoon for the year prior to going to basic training. And I got to experience asking him how to what we do as engineers at the mm-hmm. time. I didn't even really know what I was getting myself into, learning all of that. But most importantly, that mentorship really happened after I returned back from OCS and I was placed back with Sergeant Edie now as the platoon leader. So now Sergeant Edie worked for me and he took me aside right away and said, "Our, you know, our professional relationship has to change because mm-hmm. now you're my boss. However, that mentorship piece of asking me questions because you really don't know how to manage a company right. or a platoon at the time. And I didn't. Right. And right away, he established that comfort that it's okay to ask your NCOs. And I'm very grateful for that because from that day forward, I did, unless I panicked, <laughs> I always <laughs> felt comfortable asking people who have been there longer. As we talked about a little bit before we jumped on, you know, the movement in the National Guard or the movement right. in the Army. There's always somebody that's been there longer, but there's always you're moving around, especially as an officer, and you're new to something. And being able to truly ask your NCOs, the backbone of the Army, and say, I don't have a clue what I'm supposed to be doing here. Could you help me? Has been valuable. But also, then knowing that you can have maybe officers or senior commanders, whichever it is, that are not either in your direct line, but people that you've associated with, General Alkire was the S3 in the 94th Troop Command when I was there. And he was an amazing mentor for me Mm -hmm. in how to develop an Army career. I'd never really had anybody talk about, I mean, granted, right away as an officer, they tell you, you're in charge of your own career, figure it out, make your plans. Right. But I'd never had anybody really sit down and tell me how you do that, how you manage your school, how you look at opportunities for different schools, which schools make it appear better on a comb board, all of that. So 
I think it's important to understand that you can have multiple mentors. I still go to Sergeant Major Edie and ask for help Mm -hmm. all the time. I still go to General Alkire and ask for help. But like right now, I also spend a lot of time talking to my NCOs that are at the RTI. I have connections at Fort Seal because I need to understand that. I have connections at other RTIs. So I think the important thing is understanding that mentorship should be an every moment, all day opportunity. There's mentorship that can come from you. We were just visiting about the connection between the civilian world and the military world Mm -hmm. and how intertwined they are and thinking about the opportunity to go back and celebrate those relationships that we have a little bit better came to mind. Yeah, certainly. I um, I remember, you know, a million years ago, haha, when I was a cadet. <laughs> okay, it wasn't that long ago. Um, but when I was a cadet and they always told you, <clears throat> find a mentor, find a lifelong mentor, or, you know, find somebody that you can always go to. And it always, to me, I felt a lot of pressure of finding that one person. And, you know, I, I would be like, well, I have this person, but I don't want to commit to forever, you know, I don't want to get into this like mentorship where I have to be with them forever. I, I lean on them for a certain point in my career. And then, you know, you move on positions and you find a new mentor. And I think that's important. Um, you know, what I've experienced, that was the most important thing for me is finding a mentor that fit for that situation. Um, and then you kind of lean on them or, or sometimes you have those lifelong mentors, but, um, I don't know if you, you've experienced that. Well, and I think I, definitely as far as like Sergeant Major Edie and General Alkire, they've been probably career-long mentors for sure, but definitely more um, the transient mentorship is right. what I really kind of call it, is everything changes for a reason. And in my career, I think I have to be open to embracing that mentorship when it comes because if right. you're closed off to that learning you'll miss that opportunity of mentorship and you won't realize wow I could have learned a lot from this person that maybe was in my life for three months maybe two years um, maybe even just a course but really being able to instead of focus on that one person that can guide you forever because eventually if it's somebody that outranks you, then they're probably older than you, so they'll retire before you. <laughs> right. And now who do you have? <laughs> um, but also, I think it's important to look at the idea that you need to realize everything you say or do is an opportunity to mentor someone else. And it may be an informal mentorship. We talk a lot about formal mentorship, but I think that informal mentorship is actually more of a career builder or more of a life connector than the formal mentorship. Right. Yeah, that, that kind of makes me think of... Um, you know, everything that you do, people are watching or they're being influenced by the good and the bad. And so sometimes the mentorship you're gaining, or I guess I don't even know if I would call this mentorship, but it's, um, you know, sometimes you have really good bosses that you're like, wow, I want to be just like them. But then sometimes you have not so good influences or not so good um, examples of what to do, but you personally grow a lot from seeing the good and the bad. And so, I guess I don't know if I would classify the negative as mentorship, but but you are being influenced by like I would never do that as a leader. Um, I don't know if, if that makes sense. It does, and I actually can speak directly to an opportunity there that um, has been part of my career mm-hmm. for a long time as a lieutenant. In the 133rd, we had a company commander who came in just for a very short time. Not too many people would even know him. Um, But while he was there, one of the things that he took on, for whatever reason, was the concept of we would plan our drills like we always had. And definitely when you're talking engineering and moving dirt, it was a pretty intense process. You're talking equipment, you're talking driver's license, making sure you know the right soldiers have the right training, have the right licensing, all of that, plus the project planning, getting the materials. So we would spend a ton of time with the backwards design, making sure things were ready. We'd show up at drill. He always had a leadership meeting just before drill, and we would walk in, and month after month, he would say, well, I know we had this planned, but, and then he'd tell us what we were going to do for the weekend. So we would have roughly an hour to navigate, restructure our plans, and come up with something totally different than what we had thought we were going to do for the weekend and make it happen, because he was the company commander. You follow those orders. Right. Right. 
pretty quickly through that time frame, and not just myself, the platoon leaders of the other platoons, we kind of became lackadaisical in our planning and thought, well, does it really matter if we plan? Because our soldiers were getting annoyed with, you ask us to plan all this stuff just so that you can change it at the last minute. And so we quit planning and started just showing up and flying by the seat of our pants. Right. So I really kind of learned two lessons from him. First of all, I learned um, how difficult it is to put time and effort into stuff and then be told that it's useless. Right. And how invalued you feel. So I learned that I was never going to do that. I was never going to come in unless there was an emergency. I can't say that never because there's always that piece that might happen and life changes. 9-11 happened. COVID happened. I've had to make changes because of big reasons. But if at all avoidable, I stick with the plan. But the other thing that I was able to learn from that is that it's better to still have a plan, even if you mm -hmm. have to change it, than to have no plan. Because towards the end, when we had no plan, we couldn't even change the course of action. We right. just had to come up with everything. And it's a lot harder when you have to come up with everything versus just make adjustments. So right. two things in my career, stay planned, be organized, and don't change anything unless you have to. If you've told soldiers you're going to do it, follow through. Right. Um, what advice would you give for um, navigating that relationship? So, um, you know, that's a tough situation to be in, certainly, but I'm assuming, I'm, I'm sure you didn't just you know, sit by and let it happen forever. So, I mean, was there anything that you did that, you know, maybe you make a comment or how do you kind of lead upwards to make changes to protect your soldiers? Um, in all fairness, yes, we did. And actually, you know, speaking directly to the commander pretty quickly is one of the first steps that I did. And I would encourage people to do that because a lot of times, one of the things in my civilian world that I tell my prince that I tell my teachers is we we in all of my buildings and I'm in um, have changed jobs a couple times as a principal. We I give them three words. I tell people we li I live by grace, flexibility, and patience. Mm -hmm. And the first is I really don't believe people do things intentionally to be mean, occasionally, but for the most part, I don't think my commander was trying to do that just to right. be mean to the soldiers had no concept of how much planning we'd put into it. So we did try to visit with him about it, try to help him understand the impact of what his decisions were. Um, when he's like, nope, I believe it's okay, I can do this, you know, that's that's my job, that's my call, mm -hmm. then the next step really eventually was, we kind of went in as a group of lieutenants and right. talked to him. And eventually I did go around and we did talk to our battalion commander after months of seeing what had happened. And, you know, again, in the National Guard, we talk about months, but it was really like six drills. So it wasn't a terribly long time, but it was amazing how much morale could be lost in six months. So right. that's the other thing is I would never wait that long again, being young and being a second lieutenant, I waited a little longer than right. I would ever wait before. <laughs> yeah. And I would encourage people to not wait anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Um, that's difficult. You know, of course, you reminded me when you said the word second lieutenant, I just had like trauma flashbacks to to my times as a second lieutenant. But um, but it is hard. It's hard to jump into a role like that and and to feel like you have a voice and to be confident enough to go and speak up and and to, you know, speak against a, a commander or make a recommendation. But but that's definitely a good lesson to learn that, you know, it doesn't matter what rank you are, if it, if there's some concerns, you can bring them up appropriately. Um, can we talk a little bit about navigating that relationship between, you know, we talked about the platoon leader and company commander a little bit and how you can handle that, but what about navigating um, those professional relationships within your platoon or your company? I think the National Guard is so small, especially here in Wyoming, that it's hard not to be friends. It's hard not to, you know, get to know everybody and get to know everybody within the state. And, um, you know, especially being a t uh, teacher and principal outside of the National Guard, you might deal with some families or you might deal with service members that are um, maybe in your school. So how do you navigate that professional relationship and, and establish those boundaries? So, yeah, you know, that's actually one of those that has been a little more difficult being a true M day soldier. And you kind of alluded to it that awkwardly enough, sometimes 
I literally will supervise people on the civilian side that outrank me in the military. Right. And so on one hand, I'm their supervisor. And then one week in a month, they outrank me. And I talk to them in a different situation. And how do we navigate? And I think what's been important to me, and it's important to me in the civilian world, the same thing, is just establishing for me my comfort of my professional boundaries. I, early on as a principal, was mentored by a professor at the university that really spoke to me about, as an administrator, the biggest thing you have to decide is where you draw the line has to be drawn permanently. Right. And that really came with, I'm not your friend because I'm always going to be that person that writes your evaluation when it comes to my teachers. I can't be friends with people that I do evaluate in that We can be professional, we can be kind, we can be respectful, we can even hang out and have dinner. But in the end, crossing that line of true friendship, confidant of things that I would only share with my best friend can't happen. And so I really have drawn that line of professionalism and I maintain it when I'm in my uniform, I maintain it when I'm in my civilian dress. Just deciding for yourself where that line has to be drawn really has to be done early on in your career. Right. Yeah. And I I mean, like I said before, I think it's difficult in the National Guard, but but I think it makes it even more important to establish that line and to I mean, I think you can live in the gray, but you can't jump over that line. So I think that's very important, um, especially for our listeners, if anybody, you know, that that's kind of one of the key takeaways is is to make sure that you establish that boundary and and don't jump, jump over it. And I think it's important that it become a boundary that you yourself can live with because um, years ago I I read a poem that's I have to live with myself and so Mm -hmm. I have to be fit for myself to know. And that's what I had to do early on is I'm thinking if I crossed a line, um, not to say that I won't sit down and have dinner with my NCOs in Guernsey, right? but when it comes to having certain discussions, personal discussions. I'm not their friend, I'm still their supervisor. And so I draw that line and I leave and then they hang out and they do their things that they do with NCOs. And when it comes to that same thing on the civilian world, you know, I can go and have a great time with my teachers at a barbecue, but I draw the line when it comes to having those personal discussions, having that intimate, so to speak, of friendship right. that crosses the line of professionalism. And so I maintain that professional balance. It goes a little bit back to that work-life balance. Then I have to find happiness in my family and ensuring that there's that confidence that I have in my friends and in my family that are not necessarily part of either world. Right. Yeah. It's it's kind of that separation of the two. Yep. Um, yeah. So we're going to switch gears here a little bit, and I'm going to ask um, about a time in your career where maybe it was somewhat perceived as, you know, from maybe a personal perspective as you thought that it was a failure of some sort, or maybe it was an opportunity that you were given, but you didn't fully embrace the opportunity. And then you look back and you're like, dang, I should have, I should have paid attention at the time, or I should have embraced that opportunity. Or, or certainly, you know, if you thought it was a failure, but you look back and it was um, a positive in your career. So um, really, this one was a difficult one because I look at life and think of things as pretty much I try not to miss the opportunity to learn even from something that was a failure. And an opportunity, I think the biggest one that I had that I missed out on was years ago, I was given an opportunity to either be the EEO or be a TAC officer. Mm -hmm. And we actually hadn't talked about this before. And I had applied for and gotten the EEO EEO position and had gone through the victim advocacy course, gone through all the SHARP training. And then at the time, the ATAG reached out and said, hey, we really need a new TAC officer. And would you consider changing your gears. And I I didn't want to change my route. I was kind Mm -hmm. of selfish about that and said, you know, I just am in the middle of learning all of these new things and I'll do it in a little while. And I feel bad because at the time we had a pretty strong OCS program in Guernsey and the TAC officer actually managed a pretty large group of Mm -hmm. soldiers only to watch that kind of disappear. And eventually we were sending all of our 
candidates right. down to Colorado. And that tack position really didn't amount to the same thing that I would have had an opportunity to go. And I kind of felt bad for years wondering if it was an opportunity that I missed. And that's part of the reason that, you know, I never could capture that opportunity. So, but more specifically, when I looked at that and I thought about what I learned from it, I learned that it's okay to say no because the career opportunities that I got from the EOEEO position that moved me into the joint staff that then enabled me to spend a number of years learning from there. I can't regret what I didn't right. do. I have to look instead of what I did. And so I took that opportunity now as an RTI commander to pull away from Colorado and we're rebuilding our OCS program at Camp Guernsey. Right. So we're kind of severing those ties and trying to re-enhance so that our tech officer has a valuable, viable position at Camp Guernsey and try to regrow that OCS program. And so from me skipping out on an opportunity then, I'm trying to re-embrace and make sure that I have that opportunity for others now. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's good. It's um, kind of recognizing a missed opportunity, but then almost building on it and making it another opportunity that, you know, farther down in your career. Um, a lot of times, you know, we do every year annually for the comb board, we have to put together our career tracker. And I don't know if you keep your career trackers every time you resubmit one, but I think it's funny to look back. And even in my very short time as, you know, Lieutenant and now captain, um, looking at all the things that I thought I was going to do or all these adventures that, you know, in my career that I thought when I become a major, this is what I'm going to do. And how many times in five short years has it squirreled in different ways? But I think that's a good point to bring up that your career, you know, just because you take on one opportunity, it, it might circle back and you might be given that opportunity later on down the line. And I agree. I think I do keep mine. And I, you know, I would 100% thinking back to what I thought I would do mm -hmm. as a second lieutenant clear up through a lieutenant colonel. I can honestly say I don't, well, at the time, there really wasn't a lot of joint staff information, but I never picked joint staff. Right. And the time that I spent in joint staff was amazing. Um, I had never picked like an EO, EEO. I didn't really think that would be up my alley, but that time was such an, a wonderful opportunity to get to know soldiers in a different light and getting to know the joint staff, being able to work with civilians. A couple other things that I never, ever thought I would do, um, well, it's one thing, but I did it twice, is a casualty assistance officer. You know, mm -hmm. I never, nobody would ever want that job. Right. Because you don't want to have to have somebody be serving a family who has lost a loved one. But I will tell you that the two times that I served as a CAO, that I can honestly tell you the learning experience that I had, the connections that I now have with those families, the things that I was able to do, again, because I was willing to be open. I'm so glad that it happened in my career. It right. prepared me for different things. And I think you just have to be ready to be open to the learning and then Wherever your career may take you, granted, you don't want to just not have a part in it because then it will go nowhere. But right. you want to you want to make sure that you still are open to experiences that you don't even know about because you don't know what you don't know. Right. Until it happens. Right. Yeah. And and we're definitely open to or, you know, opportunities arise without. You know, you can never plan for some of these opportunities to arise. And and they kind of based on the connections you make, you know, a lot of times you make these connections and someone goes, hey, because I know you and I know your personality, I think you would be a really good fit for this. And you just can't plan on that type of stuff. No, you can't. And I think that's where it goes back to that relationship and that professional piece, because you never know, you know, what the relationships you're establishing now, the mentorships that you're developing both ways, the reputation you're building, all of that happens at any given time. And right. it will lead to better things if you keep your doors open. Right. Um, so I'd like to talk about um, a little of the things that you do professionally, you know, um, to help yourself develop. So um, are you reading any books, podcasts, or anything that you're listening to to help yourself um, beyond, of course, this podcast, if you're tuning in? <laughs> but what are some of the things that you listen to or read about that help you grow professionally? So 
I do spend a lot of time on the road between Laramie and Cheyenne, Mm -hmm. living in one spot, working in another, that kind of stuff. So I spend a lot of time listening to audiobooks. Uh, One of my favorite authors, actually, is Brene Brown. Mm -hmm. Uh, She does a lot for the civilian world as far as self-development, and I I like that process of always pushing myself, always challenging myself. One of my favorite books is uh, Crucial Conversations. It's not by Brene, but I like to listen to books that are going to help me be a better servant leader, um, mm-hmm. help me deal with conflict, because that's one of those things that at times, whether you like it or not, it can change a career. And so I spend a lot of time reading books or listening to audio books. That's probably my favorite. During the summer, I have a tendency to do more of article reading, right. short reading, just with the concept of I like to be outside, I like to travel, and I kind of like closure on things at the same time. So uh, right now, there's really the leadership now is kind of my my go-to for articles on how to improve my leadership. And mm-hmm. I like it because it crosses into both worlds. Being a high-quality leader, whether it's on the civilian side as an administrator or as an officer in the National Guard, the lessons learned, things like that, having patience, having flexibility. A lot of the lessons learned in the civilian world, especially in education from COVID, right marry up to so much of what we need in the National Guard and in our world every day. Right. Yeah, that's good. Um, So we're going to wrap it up here, but I would like to end it with um, if you have any closing comments or any advice you want to give to our listeners. Probably I would give four things. And the first one is, as I would say, take the risk. Um, I learned early on in my career that there's always that comfort zone and Mm -hmm. you can stick with where you're comfortable and it'll limit your growth. And there were times that I didn't take that risk that I really now wish I would have. But Mm -hmm. when I did take the risk, the learning was amazing. The other one I would say is enjoy each position. Sometimes we're like, man, I didn't get that command position that I wanted or I didn't get here where I wanted. Instead of always looking for what you don't have, just take and embrace each position for what you have. I would say learn from others. It, everybody around you is always doing something that you could learn from and take that opportunity at any given moment. And then last, say no when you have to. Mm-hmm. Say yes when you can. Excellent. Well, th- that was really good um, advice and a good closing comment. So thank you so much, ma'am, for coming in and telling us about some of the lessons you learned. Um, and thank you to our listeners for tuning into another episode with some great lessons. And I sure hope you learned something. If you're interested in sharing some of your lessons, email us in the public affairs office at yoguard at gmail.com or give us a call at 307-772-5040. If you like this episode or our previous episodes, tell your friends, tell your family, and of course, don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening.